Welcome back to Introduction to Logic. This is Module 3. In the last module, we surveyed the terrain of logic broadly. This bird's eye view offered us a helpful sense of breadth for the purpose of grasping a better understanding of the nature of the discipline as a whole. What is required now is depth. We need to begin again to break down various aspects of what we've encountered so far and to learn how to practice logical inquiry and analysis in a variety of ways, using a variety of methods and approaches. We begin in this module by revisiting the anatomy of an argument, specifically looking at how to identify arguments and argument structures. Let me begin by giving credit where it is due. I mentioned at the end of the last lecture that a good deal of the material I used to develop this course in logic came from some of the open access and open education resources that had been made available out there. And while not everything out there that is advertised as open access educational resources is good, I've been particularly pleased with the quality of resources that have been made available by philosopher James Fieser, especially when it comes to the discipline of logic. And so while I pull from a variety of resources and even have contributed some of my own for this course, I do want to acknowledge that more than half of the material that I've used in this course has come from some of these resources made available by James Fieser. Last week and this week, I have pulled a bit from his essay in Logic, from his Great Issues in Philosophy, and beginning this week and then throughout the rest of the course, I will be pulling heavily from his own course in logic, Philosophy 305, which he teaches at the University of Tennessee in Martin. This week I will be pulling specifically from his resource on argument structures. Okay, so in the last module we said that all arguments have to have premises and a conclusion. Now, although real-life examples of argumentation, such as those found in a published article or a social media rant, are often disorganized, in the study of logic, we like to rearrange these arguments into what we call a standard form. That is, claim, claim, conclusion, or premise, premise, conclusion. Or another way to think of it is reason, 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 leading to something you should believe. We also noted the distinction in Module 2 between a proposition and a propositional utterance. A proposition is a statement about the world that is either true or false, whereas an utterance, as it is formulated, is not clearly a true or false statement. Now, it may indeed imply something that is true or false, but it is not formulated in that clear way. And so we would have to reformulate the propositional utterance in order to draw out the clear proposition. Get off my lawn is not a true or false statement. It is just an utterance. Now, if we reformulated it so as to say, you'd better get off my lawn or else, now it's clearly implying a true or false situation in which if you get on my lawn or stay on my lawn, something will happen to you. And if you get off my lawn, you will avoid an undesirable consequence. In this module, we want to begin looking at the way propositions are thrown together in order to draw out what is meant to be inferred from the statements given. How do the premises presented lead to the conclusion? Or, when we are given something to believe, followed by several reasons for it, how exactly are these evidences supposed to connect back to the claim? First, we should recall how we can recognize some of the inferences given. An inference indicator is a word or phrase used to signal the presence of an argument. So we are looking at the signals that indicate either, for example, a premise or a conclusion. In the statement, since all humans are mortal and Socrates is human, it follows that Socrates is mortal. The phrase, it follows, signals our conclusion, whereas the word since indicates our premise. And there are a number of indicators to familiarize yourself with. 
Common premise indicators include because, for, for the reason that, given that, in view of the fact that, since, as shown by the fact that, assuming that, granted that, inasmuch as, it is a fact that, one cannot doubt that, seeing that or seeing how, the reason is that, and this is true because, note also, and this is where things can become messy, arguments do not always flow in standard form when they are stated. Someone may not necessarily lay out the premises and then give the conclusion. Sometimes people begin with the conclusion or the claim and then support it with evidence. So if, for example, we begin with since or given that or granted that, in these cases we are leading with the premise. But it could also be the case that we give a conclusion and then follow it with statements such as the reason is because, or this is true because. Conclusion indicators probably most often come in the form so, therefore, and thus, but conclusions can also be signaled with words or phrases like accordingly, consequently, for this reason, hence, as a result, from which we can infer that, in conclusion, it follows that, the moral is, this being so, this proves that, we can conclude that, which means that, or which proves that. Our primary focus in this module is to learn how to use argument diagrams. Now all diagrams use symbols, but there are two different approaches we might take. One comes in the form of what we call a logical tree and we will look at that later. But we begin with what we might call sentence form, where we lay out our symbols in a manner flowing from left to right, just as we would in a sentence or a mathematical equation. Now, both forms of diagram use the arrow symbol to signal that something is intended as evidence for something else. So if we have an X arrow pointing to Y, that signals either X is the premise, Y is the conclusion that follows, or perhaps X is an evidence leading to the claim of Y. Now, the sort of diagram that we are calling sentence form also uses a plus symbol to signal that two things are meant to be taken together. For example, it may be the case that X alone cannot indicate Z, and Y alone does not indicate Z, yet X and Y taken together can give you the conclusion Z. Now there are three types of argument inferences that we need to understand in order to diagram. Now the example I just gave was an example of a joint inference because the premises must be taken together in order to produce the conclusion. Each premise independently cannot do that. X plus Y leads to Z. X does not lead to Z. Y does not lead to Z. Here's an example. The roof is sagging, but it is propped up. Therefore, the roof will not collapse anytime soon. Now, a sagging roof alone would likely signal concern, right? Because a roof that's not doing what it's supposed to do, that looks like it's beginning to fall, suggests that the roof may not stay up. It may collapse. So that information by itself is not enough to lead to the conclusion. To say that the roof is propped up, therefore it will not collapse, is somewhat puzzling in one sense, because if a roof is doing what it's supposed to do, why would we need to say anything about it collapsing? What reason would we have to think that it might collapse in the first place? But more importantly, we are trying to look at what the speaker is intending to indicate in their own arrangement of the proposition. And they have given us a conjunction. This, but this also. Two things that are meant to be taken together. So if we are trying to draw out the argument that it seems they are trying to make, then the form would be one and two taken together should lead us to three.
So our diagram might look like this. 1 plus 2, arrow points to 3. Here's another example. Everyone at the party is a biochemist, and all biochemists are intelligent. Therefore, since Sally is at this party, Sally is intelligent. Can the premise, everyone at the party is a biochemist, lead us to the conclusion that Sally is intelligent? Can we conclude that Sally is intelligent from the premise that all biochemists are intelligent? If that is all the information we have, no. Nor can we conclude Sally's intelligence from the fact that she is at the party. It seems then that we need all three lines of evidence in order to draw the conclusion that Sally must be intelligent. Now the speaker gave us the first two lines of evidence as a conjunction, this and that. But then the language got a little messy, didn't it? Because next we read therefore, which signals a conclusion is coming, immediately followed by since, which signals that yet another premise is being brought forward for our consideration. But as we saw, we can't get to the conclusion without all three parts. So we should understand that actually this is a three-part conjunction. Points one plus two plus three lead or point to conclusion four. Our second type of inference is called an independent inference. In this case, each premise by itself is able to lead to the same conclusion. So we are given two or more distinct arguments for the same conclusion, each of which is able to stand independently of the others. What if someone concludes that the roof will likely collapse soon because one, the roof is sagging, and two, it has been leaking for years? In this case, if the roof is sagging and not well propped, it may well lead to the claim that it will collapse soon. Moreover, if the roof has been leaking for years, that too, on its own, may give us reason to conclude that the roof may collapse soon. So taken together, we have one leads to three and two leads to three. Now here the speaker did use a conjunction, and. However, as we said, language can be messy, and what is actually implied in their argument is not that you need both in order to make the conclusion, but that either one of these evidences can lead to the conclusion. The and simply represents, here are two evidences that I have put together. Here's another example. The grass is way too high. The weeds are out of control. The neighbors think our yard looks shabby. Thus, it's time to mow the lawn. Now, if your yard has weeds that are out of control, you may conclude it's time to mow. If the grass is way too high, you may think it's time to mow. And if you're fine with the way it looks, but your neighbors keep complaining about your yard looking like it needs to be mowed, then that might in and of itself be reason to conclude you should mow. So in this case, each of the three lines of evidence individually or independently may point to the conclusion. So the speaker has laid out three evidences, each of which point to the conclusion. We would diagram this in the following way. One leads to four and two leads to four and three leads to four. The third and final type of inference is called an inference chain. In this case, the conclusion of one argument becomes the premise of another. So you have a premise leading to a conclusion, which becomes a new premise leading to a new conclusion, and so on. Because I am a human being, I am rational. Therefore, I am no fool. So what's being implied here is that to be a human being is to be a rational being. Therefore, to be a rational being is to be rational. To be rational is not to be foolish. Therefore, I am no fool. So our argument is presented in a chain-like manner where one leads to two, two leads to three. So we would diagram it with a one, arrow pointing to two, arrow pointing to three. She could not have known that the money was missing from the safe since she had no access to the safe itself. 
Thus, there was nothing she could have done, and so she bears no guilt in the incident. Here, the ultimate conclusion is she bears no guilt, and this is built on the assumption that there was nothing she could have done. That was actually built on the assumption that she could not have known the money was missing, and this was built on the initial premise that she had no access to the safe. So because she had no access, she couldn't have known there was no money in it, so there was nothing she could have done, therefore she bears no guilt. Now notice in this case, the argument is actually jumping around. We get what turned out to be the second premise first. So our argument would read 2 leading to 1, leading to 3, leading to 4. Now there are a number of problems that we can run into in our language and we will look at the problem with definitions in the next module. But one major problem we can run into is ambiguity. Sometimes we have to navigate areas where clarification is just not given, things are left unsaid, the author perhaps presumes certain things, the author may even presume certain knowledge on the reader's part. And the reader may also bring certain presumptions into the conversation. And so if the reader presumes the author is speaking about one thing rather than another, that can cause a problem with the analysis of arguments. So one thing we have to do is check our own presumptions. And then we may also have to take note of certain presumptions on the part of the speaker or we may have to just try to look around the presumptions in order to see the ultimate argument that the author is trying to make. Some presumptions we may not be able to spot easily, but some we can. And one of the types that we can spot is implication or implicit statements. An implicit statement is a hidden statement within an argument that is incompletely expressed, such as the author's intention. The author may intend for the reader to draw a certain conclusion, and yet the author may not have ever actually spelled that out. They may not have actually given the conclusion to be drawn. This happens all the time in student papers when it comes to a thesis statement. In my own experience, I've noticed one point of distinction between English writing and philosophy courses when it comes to a thesis. Again, in my own experience, it seems that English writing courses often encourage their students to disguise explicit statements and use sort of an artistic eloquence to imply the intent but not come out and say it. While that approach may work well for writing a novel, it is not a good approach to philosophical conversation, and it is a bad approach to any well-written argumentative essay. In philosophy, the concepts are deep enough. We don't want to make it even harder for the reader or the listener by disguising what we're trying to say. Moreover, if you're trying to make an argument in an argumentative essay, for example, you need to make clear what your reader is about to read and why. That is, within the introductory portion of your essay, you need to present an explicit thesis statement. This essay will argue blank. Or in this essay, I will show why X is better than Y. This way, the reader is not reading through this entire paper only to get to the end and say, what did I read? What exactly is the point the author is trying to make? And this is just using a thesis statement as an example. We just looked at examples of an inference chain. Imagine how difficult it will be to pull out the argument and diagram it if each of the conclusions is left ambiguous and implied but never actually stated. But this happens a lot in argumentation especially when the author is so confident of their perspective that they presuppose that you will just see it and be able to make the connections. 
So no doubt, trying to follow some arguments or trying to read through some essays can be frustrating, especially if it seems the author is bringing a lot of presumption, they are allowing a lot of room for ambiguity, leaving things unclarified, and also if they are implying certain things but not actually establishing those points or especially if they're giving you the conclusions but not really giving you much of the, the evidence or the grounding support that you think the argument needs. However, as good philosophers, we want to always try to apply a principle of charity. That is, we want to give the person arguing the benefit of the doubt, and we want to try to make their argument as strong as possible while remaining faithful to their original thoughts. So even if an argument is not well articulated, even if it's messy, even if there are problems with it, to be charitable to the speaker that is trying to present their case, we want to try to understand their argument in its strongest form. And when we are trying to develop that argument for them uh, in order to critique it, or just to, for example, diagram it and make sure that we or someone else can follow it, we want to try to build it in its strongest form. If you build it poorly, you may misrepresent the perspective or the person speaking. In my ethics class, for example, some of my students struggle to understand self-interest with the question, should I focus on doing whatever is in my own self-interest, or do I have a moral obligation to subvert my own interests in order to do things for other people I don't know? For example, uh, laying down my own interests in the name of some greater good for some greater number. And so when students wrestle with this, some will attack this position as selfish. In other words, they just see this as meaning if you don't do things for other people, uh, or for example, for the majority, then it's because you kind of are, are a hedonist. You are just focusing on your pleasure and your desires and you want life to be all about you. However, I remind them, it is possible that someone's interests involves their loved ones. So to ask me to lay down my own interests in the name of some greater good for my nation or something may actually not just be asking me to give up some of my pleasures. It may be asking me to lay down my life for my country, in which case I can't take care of my family, or it may be asking me to act contrary to the happiness of my family and immediate community because it is in the better interest of a larger group in the country. So someone's hesitance here to act on behalf of some larger group, if that means giving up the well-being of their family, that's not the same as just being interested in their own physical pleasures. So in other words, where some of my students are quick to call the self-interested person, selfish person, they may not be the same thing, and to reduce self-interest to mere pleasure-based selfishness is to misrepresent the view. So we have to be careful with misrepresentation if we are going to try to uh, understand another view. Also, if we are going to critique another view, the first thing we need to be able to do is to build the case for that other view in its strongest form. That way we can be sure that we are dealing with the actual logic and argumentation and not simply attacking a caricature of that view, which is one of our fallacies called the straw man fallacy. Other issues of ambiguity we might run into involve compound sentences. A compound sentence is a sentence that contains two or more elements they might be conjoined with and or but or something like this. If possible, we should try to break them down. If they're a compound that can be broken down, a breakable compound, then it will be helpful to be able to break them apart in order to identify the separate pieces. Recall the example I gave with the leaking roof earlier. 
the roof is sagging and it has been leaking for years, therefore it will likely collapse soon. In this case we have two premises that are conjoined, but if we break them apart, in this case we are able to see that each individual premise leads to the conclusion. This will help us to see that our diagram should read 1 leads to 3 and 2 leads to 3 rather than 1 plus 2 leads to 3. These are breakable compounds, but sometimes we have unbreakable compounds. These are statements that should not be split into separate statements. They should be treated as a complete statement. For example, if I say either this is the case or this is the case, then my language is signaling that these two things need to be taken under consideration together. It's the same thing with the conditional. If this is the case, then that will follow. That sort of statement needs to be considered as a whole. Here are some general steps that philosopher James Fieser gives for diagramming arguments. First, Bracket each statement in a way that best reveals the structure of the argument. Then circle the clue words and, but, therefore. Number each statement sequentially in the order they appear in the sentence. Identify the conclusion. If the conclusion is implied, supply it and number it. If it's not clearly stated, then state it in the clearest and strongest way. What is it that the author is really trying to say? Then once you've identified the conclusion, work backwards to the premises. Determine if any premise leads independently to the conclusion or if they should be taken together. Then determine if there are intermediate conclusions where some of the premises given lead to a conclusion which then leads to the final conclusion. And then finally, determine which premises need to be taken together. And then put them in order. Now, argument diagrams can be drawn in a number of ways. As I mentioned earlier, diagrams can be represented in a sentence-like manner, flowing from left to right, as we saw with one arrow three, or one plus two points to three, etc. But argument diagrams can also be depicted in a more visually engaging form called a logical tree. While such depictions may be found in a manner flowing horizontally, it is preferred that they flow in a vertical manner. Moreover, while you may come across a depiction which flows vertically upward, logical trees are typically depicted so as to flow downward and it is usually preferred that they should be diagrammed in this way, from the evidences and supporting arguments as if applicable, downward to the main premises, and finally down to the main conclusion at bottom. Now it might be easy to confuse our terminology at this point because in one sense, argument diagrams could be depicted so as to flow horizontally or vertically. So here it will be important to understand that vertical means something very particular when it is used to describe one type of tree diagram in contrast to another. In this case, a vertical tree diagram will always refer to a simple premise leading to conclusion form or else an inference chain where we have one circle or box representing a given premise pointing to the next, a conclusion, pointing on to the next, another conclusion which follows from the previous conclusion, etc., etc. All other forms of tree diagrams are referred to as horizontal diagrams, meaning that multiple premises existing on the same horizon lead down, whether independently or taken together, to a given conclusion. And most arguments take the form of a horizontal tree diagram. Still, there are differing types, but the two most important you should be able to spot or visualize are independent inferences and joint inferences. With independent inferences, we should see each idea leading directly independently to the conclusion. 
and with joint inferences we should see that two or more ideas must be taken together in order to lead us down to the conclusion. Visualizing an argument is quite helpful in understanding what exactly is being argued and in seeing more clearly what may or may not follow. It will be difficult, however, to diagram an argument if you're not even clear about what it is trying to say. So you will need to be able to distinguish premises and conclusions, and you must be able to recognize which premises stand alone in drawing you to the conclusion and which premises require other premises in order to make that move. So returning to our earlier example, the roof is sagging and the roof is leaking, therefore it's likely to fall soon. Now in this case, either one of those points can give us reason to draw the conclusion. And so we have independent inferences. So with a tree diagram, we would draw a box labeled one, an arrow pointing downward to three, and then horizontal to the box labeled one, we would also make a box labeled two, also pointing independently down to the box labeled three. All men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. In this case, just the information that Socrates is a man is not enough to lead to the conclusion unless we couple it with the premise that all men are mortal. So too, if we only have the premise that all men are mortal, we know nothing of Socrates, and so we cannot conclude that Socrates is mortal. For all we know, Socrates could have been an immortal being. But when one and two are taken together, they lead down to three. So our diagram would show a box labeled one, a box labeled two existing on the same horizontal plane, and then we would show that they are connected. So we would draw a connecting line between them and then have that line pointing down to the conclusion, box three. Now these are the two basic forms, but they can become more complex. For example, we may have a premise that leads to our conclusion, and then we have another conclusion that leads to our conclusion, and that preceding conclusion is built upon two forms of evidence or two premises. So in this case, we might have boxes one and two taken together and then leading down to the conclusion. And then separate from boxes one and two, we may have box three leading down independently to the conclusion. Meaning that if we only look at evidence one and evidence two, this should lead us to the conclusion. And if we only look at evidence three, it should also lead to the conclusion. Yet the author has laid three forms of evidence on the table for consideration. And so we show that one and two taken together lead to four and three independently can lead to four. Similarly, we might have a joint inference where premise one and premise two are taken together in order to lead us down to our conclusion. And the author may have also given us evidence to support one of his premises, such as premise two. And suppose that the evidence presented for premise two, two forms of evidence, each one of them would independently lead us to the conclusion that became the second premise for our final conclusion. So in this case, we might have one coupled with two, both existing on the same horizontal plane, and then in another horizontal plane existing above premises one and two, we might draw above premise two, a third box showing that some given evidence will lead us directly to premise two, and a fourth box showing that some other form of evidence will also lead us independently down to premise two. And then we make clear that box one and box two taken together jointly infer the main conclusion to be drawn. So it doesn't really matter whether you use these tree diagrams or whether you prefer to use the more sentence-like um, left or right style that you find in like a mathematical formula.
If you're dealing with a more complex argument, people often prefer a tree diagram because it's easier to see how each line of reasoning points down to the conclusion rather than having to remember as you read left to right here's some evidence pointing to this premise and these premises lead to this conclusion and this will lead to the main conclusion and then here's some other stuff leading to a conclusion that will also lead to the main conclusion if you can just see everything pointing downward to the main conclusion sometimes that's a bit more helpful. Now I did mention that while it is preferred that you draw your diagram in such a way that truth flows downward, you may well encounter diagrams that do not work in that way. And so I wanted to give you some examples here. And this, depending on how you think, this may actually work better for you if you're really concerned with scrutinizing someone's grounding for their beliefs. In moral dialogue especially, I personally can be pretty skeptical in doubting that many people can back up many of the assertions they make. And so if you're like me, this sort of visualization might be helpful where you see their conclusion up top, you see where they're going, and you're really trying to look at how they got there and what is their grounding. And so in this case, if you're really concerned with their overall grounding upon which all of their arguments hang, then it might be more helpful to think of it in this way. And you're trying to dig down to see whether their core premises are anchored well or whether they're just floating there unsupported. So you may actually prefer this way. If it helps, that's fine. In this image that I just randomly pulled from a Google search, we also see something else that might be helpful to you as a student of logic. And that is, we see different types of arguments labeled. So you see on the far left, a simple inference. This premise leads to that one. Easy. Next, you see an inference chain. This premise leads to that premise, which leads to that conclusion. And then there's the independent inference, which here is called a convergent inference, which simply means that this independent premise and this independent premise converge upon the same conclusion. And then finally we have a linked or joint inference where premises are taken together in order to lead us to the conclusion. And finally here is one other image that I pulled from the web from a random Google search because it is helpful in both showing yet again that you may encounter some diagrams that flow in a different direction. In this case, they flow from right to left, but it is a tree diagram working from evidences and premises to a conclusion. This is also an example of why some people prefer a tree diagram because there's a lot to consider here and sometimes it's just more helpful if you can visualize how all the parts are moving together. Again, our primary goal for this module is learning how to analyze an argument and diagram an argument. And this will require our understanding of um, types of inference and also our understanding of premise and conclusion indicators. While that is our primary aim for the module, we should also begin to consider other things like what is the point of an argument? What is the relevance of the premises given? And what is the evidence for the conclusions drawn? Most of what we've discussed so far address only two of these questions. What is the point of the argument? What are we really trying to get at here? That's identifying the conclusion. What is the evidence for the conclusions drawn? This is the premises or the lines of reasoning or supporting evidences for a premise that are pointing us down to the conclusion. So we need to understand what the evidence is or what the premises are and what the conclusion or the main point of the argument is in order to diagram the argument. But then to begin to scrutinize or analyze the logic of the argument, we also need to be able to dig into the relevance of the premises. Before we even consider whether a premise is true or false, we may have to ask if it's even relevant at all. If someone is trying to tell you that their town 
is the best place to live and you should consider moving. And they say things like, it's got a great library and a beautiful park. And I know a guy, he is the nicest man you'll ever meet. Do any of these reasons given really support the belief that this is the greatest place to live? Or the belief that you should move there? No, in this case, the evidence seems irrelevant. This concludes our exploration of Module 3. In the next module, we will look at the logic of language. In particular, we will look at the form and function of language. We will identify different types of disputes. And we will look at the nature of definitions and how we run into problems when it comes to our use of definitions. Until next time, think well and ponder long.